Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us here for Crime 2 News First at 4. I'm Whitney Ward alongside Crime 2's Laura Petty, of course. And we just obtained 911 records from an unruly scene at Lewis and Clark High School that then prompted a police response. This is all part of an ongoing investigation into the safety of local schools and the response by administration. So the tapes give us a little insight into those pretty chaotic moments that did lead to a lot of frustration last night during a Spokane City uh, School Board meeting. So covering the story from the beginning now is Laura Papetti and she's been here to talk about the new information and what we know so far. That's right. We've had a lot coming in over the past several hours. So when the incident happened, we immediately here at CREM2 requested the 911 tapes, hoping to give some clarity and context to what was described to us as a chaotic mob. Right. Again, those aren't words we chose. That is how it's described to us. Uh, students hurling threats at teachers and staff. Today we received those tapes, the 911 tapes, and this comes after last night's meeting where a Lewis and Clark teacher spoke to the school board about ongoing violence and what he says is a lack of response. 911, what's the Crim 2 obtained the 911 tapes through a public records request that helps give some context of a disruptive scene between students and staff at Lewis and Clark High School. The calls came from a staff member inside the school. On the tape, you can hear people shouting in chaos while the staff member sends out a plea for police. A student also provided Creme 2 with cell phone footage from the scene. What is going I'm, on at Lewis I'm and calling 911. We've got students coming in and out of our office. We need police at Lewis and Clark right away. The 911 operator continues to ask questions, trying to get background while sending officers in response. What is going on with this? We have students that are coming in our office threatening us and they're all over the place. There's a mob of them. Can we just have some police here? Yes. The fear from that school day on May 5th spilled over into frustration at the Spokane Public School Board meeting this week. Teachers continuing to call for help, but instead of police asking for policies to change. We've been begging at our school easily since October uh, for things to change because it just seems like we're, are we just waiting for disaster? Is that the point? I, I, I don't get the point. It just, it, it's insane to me. Lewis and Clark math teacher Matt Tolley Rupert spoke to the district and specifically to Superintendent Adam Swinyard, saying the problem of safety at schools isn't limited to a one-time event, but an ongoing issue. One that he says has been ignored, putting staff and students at risk. I just find it hard to, to recognize all of these stories that I've heard all year that are so disturbing. But yet we, we, we're waiting for a, a bigger disaster before we see, oh, we didn't know there was any issues. When a mob of kids come in this office yeah. and start threatening us, I'm absolutely calling the police. Yeah, absolutely. So I just let you guys know. Not a problem. I've got okay. you Lewis and Clark. Okay. And uh, there's still right. that request for officer contact. Awesome. Thank Thanks. you. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Bye. Bye. So again, receiving information from a teacher and from the 911 tape. So we did reach out to the school district to request a statement and to talk with the superintendent. Now, we were told Adam Swinyard was not available today, the superintendent, but we did get a statement released to us from the school district. We are posting the full response, but I wanted to share some pertinent information that comes from, from that response. Regarding this specific incident, while accounts of what happened varied, we do know that there were no weapons present, no physical violence, and no disruption to classrooms. This is again coming from the school district. Also saying, since this incident occurred, LC administrators have been talking with staff and families about how to best move forward as a learning community. So again, this is part of an ongoing investigation that we're doing here at CREM 2. We continue to air uh, stories on the subject of violence in our schools and the response, and we will continue to do so. We are committed to that. But again, some new information coming in, and we're posting all of it in its entirety on CREM.com. Laura, thank you very much. And of course, we will continue to follow this, and we'll mm -hmm. let you know if and when we do have a chance to sit down and talk with the superintendent, as I know that we have questions, not just that are our questions, but from parents and families who are wondering how the district is responding. And we continue to, to, to ask for those interviews mm -hmm. and sit down to talk about school violence. But because now the FBI is involved with this case, um, per our investigation over the last several months, uh, we do know the school district has not wanted to sit down and talk about uh, mandatory reporting as we've been talking about. And so we can, we'll continue to make those requests and, and let you know when we get the very latest. And all the information that we do have so far, you can find on crem.com right now.
In the meantime, right now, LC students are also dealing with safety issues outside of the building. Fed up with car prowlers in her school's parking lot, one LC student organized a meeting to come up with a plan to make the entire area safer. Lewis and Clark student Leilani Santiago had her car broken into in March. Thieves smashed a window, took a pair of sunglasses, but that wasn't the worst of it. They poured Mountain Dew into her gas tank, damaging the damages totaled $3,000. Leilani then started a safety committee at her school. Last night, she held a meeting with students, parents, police officers, and volunteers. The goal today is to inform everyone about what has been done, what is being done, and brainstorm ideas for what can be done. Leilani says cameras would help and so would extra patrols. She says campus safety specialists do walkthroughs during school hours, but no one's really assigned after school during plays or sporting events. Spokane Police Lieutenant Steve Braun says two months ago, neighborhood resource officers did increase their presence in that area and calls for service reduced from 93 to 57 in just the two weeks after that uh, series of emphasis patrols. Vehicle prowling reports then went from 18 to three. Now, Leilani says she also plans to bring the parking lot issues before city council members at their meeting on Monday. So we'll continue to follow that for you as well. All right, let's quickly take a break from the headlines. Let's head outside where it's kind of been a mix of, of uh, sun, mostly clouds today. Our chief meteorologist Jeremy Lagu is here to tell us what's in store for tomorrow because it's Friday. Oh, it is Friday. <laughs> and you know, Whitney, I was just trying to soak in every bit of warmth because it is a little bit warmer outside but those temperatures are uh, going to drop as our next little frontal boundary works its way through. That does move in later on this evening, and we are going to see a big change as that happens. Right now, temperatures in the mid 50s, pretty widespread across much of the inland northwest, but look at Moses Lake. That rain already coming down. You can see it making its way through central Washington, and as it moves in, we will see things change rather drastically. Here we go. Let's go ahead and slow things down so we can get a good sense of what we have going on. Those showers now moving into Ritzville and making their way toward us. I think they hit us in the six o'clock hour, then in Coeur d'Alene in say the 630 half hour, and they're moving out rather quickly. By nine, we dry out through much of eastern Washington and then dry out across the inland northwest. On the back side of this, a little bit of snow up in the mountains that stays over 4,000 feet. So basically think of it this way. It's those mountain passes that you're going to have to worry about, and that's it. Temperatures fall into the mid-30s tonight, and then climb into the mid-50s tomorrow with a mix of clouds and sun. All right, sounds good, Jeremy. Thank you very much. And sports director Brenna Green is joining us now. Kind of a big day if you're a Seahawks fan. Yeah, the official oh. schedule uh, <laughs> is released in about, is going to be released in about an hour, but already there's a few schedule leaks out there, including a big one. Big. For Seattle. In the first week of the season, the Seattle Seahawks will be playing against the Denver Broncos in Seattle on Monday Night Football. On the surface, you might be like, why is this big? Well, the Seahawks traded former quarterback Russell Wilson to Denver this offseason. So Russ's first game in orange and blue will be back in Seattle in front mm. of his former fan base. This one is going to be spicy. By the way, the other game that is always hotly contested that we already know about is the Seahawks will play in San Francisco mm. against the 49ers in week two. The full schedule is going to be released in an hour on NFL Network. Normally that would be a big deal, right? Knowing about the 49ers, but that pales in comparison now, of course, to Denver. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> That's just going to be an absolutely massive game. Russell hasn't really said anything yeah. yet on social media, but I would imagine uh, that it's going to be probably something cheesy because that <laughs> that is his brand. Um, that's why we love him. So, so there you go. So the game uh, could be obviously really interesting for players, of course, because that's yes. got, they have to be a little conflicted about it. Yeah, uh, as of right now, it seems like Drew Locke, who the Broncos traded to Seattle, mm -hmm. will be the Seahawks starting quarterback. So that's going to be a lot for him, I'm yeah. sure. And also you've got several receivers in Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf who are used to receiving yeah. passes from Russ. I'm sure that's going to be a trip for them to see Russell on the same field in Seattle in a completely different uniform. I know they can all be gracious about it. It will just be yes. interesting to see how it all plays out. And of course, I'm hoping that we just trample all over the Broncos. <laughs> that that place is going to be on yes, fire on uh, the first Monday of the season. That's going to be a lot of fun. Already looking forward to it, Brenna. Yeah, Thanks very thank much. You.
All right, still to come in other top headlines today, the man who became a hero to the militia movement across the country has now died. Randy Weaver dead at age 74. That's according to a social media post from his daughter, Sarah. Weaver became a household name back in 1992 when federal marshals surrounded his cabin in Ruby Ridge, Idaho. Weaver was wanted on weapons charges. An 11 day standoff then ended with federal marshals killing Weaver's wife and his team teenage son. A federal agent was also shot and killed in that siege. Weaver was acquitted in the death of, of that agent, though, and was only convicted of minor weapons charges. The Ruby Ridge standoff then became, of course, a rallying cry for anti-government extremists, including the Oklahoma City bomber Timothy McVeigh. In other top stories, the Attorney General's office just completed a project aiming to bring justice to potentially thousands of sexual assault survivors. It involves collecting several hundred DNA samples from sex offenders who lawfully owed a DNA sample but failed to provide it. There is another problem that's related, which is convicted felons in our state are legally required to provide their DNA to law enforcement. But the reality is many thousands have slipped through the cracks. So by pushing to follow up on those missing DNA samples, the team has now identified 635 offenders. Out of those, eight matches with cold cases have been made that are now waiting for review. And local law enforcement can better solve these cases. And they have now been sitting on for years and hopefully bring some justice to those sexual assault survivors. As we continue our extensive coverage on growth here in the Inland Northwest, we're taking a look at a new program working toward a solution for this housing shortage we are seeing right now. And it's been pretty popular so far. We'll have all those details in our Boomtown coverage coming up. Plus, it is Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Month. And here at Creme 2, we're doing what we can to, faci to facilitate open and honest conversations. And tonight at 4.30, we're hearing from one concert pianist about her experience.